bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and may the Lord's face shine upon you. How wonderful if this blessing were true. Sure, it could be said that people have an unspoken agreement to treat cats and dogs differently from other animals. After all, most people don't eat them, hunt them, or use them for clothing. In exchange for their companionship, we've promised to love and nurture them. But these promises have not been kept. We say we love them, yet most dogs and cats are treated with the same disrespect we show other animals. Most are born to be betrayed. Humane societies estimate that each year in the United States, over 15 million unwanted cats and dogs are euthanized in animal shelters. Even worse, millions of homeless cats and dogs suffer and die from starvation, disease, and torture. Millions more are killed on streets and highways. Who betrayed them? People who breed cats and dogs, including purebreds, contribute to the staggering numbers of unwanted animals. Estimates show that on average, 25%, one in four of all animals taken in by animal shelters are purebred. The largest registry of purebred dogs in the United States, the American Kennel Club, admits to having no control over where and how dogs are bred and sold. Consequently, the nearly 500,000 AKC registered dogs sold each year are bred with genetic defects, personality disorders, and other conditions. The breeding industry perpetuates the idea that cats and dogs are items to be bought and sold. They foster the idea that some cats and dogs, those with so-called status, are the most desirable. Millions of these registered dogs come from breeding farms known as puppy mills. There are an estimated 5,000 of these facilities located mostly in the Midwest where anti-cruelty laws are lax. In puppy mills, dogs are confined in cages with wire mesh floors that cut their feet. The dogs are fed cheap food and in some cases the remains of other dogs who died from the harsh conditions. A 20% death rate for newborn puppies is considered the norm in the puppy mill business. The imprisoned adult dogs are doomed to years of suffering. These dogs are forced to spend their entire lives in cramped cages without adequate veterinary care, adequate food and water, or shelter from extremes of heat and cold. The females are bred every time they come in season. When the female falls off in production, she is shot or gassed. The litters are taken from their mothers as young as four to six weeks, sold to brokers who ship them in hot, cramped trucks across thousands of miles to buyers, usually pet stores. Most puppies arrive at the pet store with registration papers from the American Kennel Club. They also arrive with a number of physical and psychological deficiencies. Many are infected with at least one parasite or develop kennel cough, parvo, or distemper. Cats lag behind dogs as money makers for the pet industry. Most of them come from unwanted litters. To save on overhead, Pet stores rarely spend money on veterinary care. 
Often store employees are called upon to administer medical care. Or more likely, the sick animal is quarantined in a box or cage in the back room, away from the view of the customer. Pet shops place puppies and kittens in their windows to attract impulse buyers who often tire of the animal when the novelty wears off. The few regulations governing the pet industry are usually not enforced. Pet shops, particularly large chains, are often found having unsanitary conditions, neglecting animals, selling sick animals to the public, and denying sick animals medical care. For every animal exhibited in a pet shop, many others suffered and died before reaching the store. People who buy animals from pet shops are, with their dollars, supporting a system of cruelty from the puppy mill to the retail pet shop. Not all breeders are big business. Many breed their cat or dog for fun or profit, maybe give a few away, abandon the rest. Regardless, anyone who deliberately breeds cats and dogs adds to the numbers of unwanted animals. However, the majority of these unwanted dogs and cats are caused by people who simply refuse to spay or neuter their companion animals. Consider this. If all lived, in just six years, one female dog and her descendants could produce 67,000 puppies. In just seven years, one female cat and her descendants could produce 420,000 cats. Spaying and neutering would prevent these births. Both procedures, performed under anesthesia, remove the reproductive organs of the animal. Studies show that spaying and neutering cats and dogs contributes to their health and extends their lifespan. Female dogs have a high incidence of breast cancer as they get older. If a female dog has an ovarian hysterectomy or a spade under two years of age, we can practically rule out her ever developing this type of cancer. Also, as female dogs and cats get older, they tend to develop uterine infections and tumors and cysts of the ovaries. If they've had an ovarian hysterectomy, these things can't develop as they get older. Male dogs and cats sometimes have problems because of not being neutered. Male dogs tend to develop prostate infections and tumors, sometimes tumors of the testicle or the prostate gland. And again, if they've been neutered, they can't develop these in their older age. Contrary to what people say, they usually don't find permanent good homes for the puppies or kittens. People are often eager to place animals and rarely follow up on what happens to them later. This cat is a typical example of problems that shelters see on a regular basis. She's emaciated, pregnant, and with skin problems, and yet she was brought in by her owner. When they got her, they probably loved her to death as a kitten, but they were not able or unwilling to provide the type of care that cats need. And it's probably the first responsible thing that they've done to bring her here to the shelter, rather than abandon her or, or uh, give her away to someone in the supermarket parking lot, which people often do. Every day, pathetic homeless dogs and cats suffer and die. They live a life of constant fear, tormented by hunger, thirst, disease, weather extremes, and cruel humans. Their misery is usually ended by a long, painful death, alone, abandoned, out of sight of the people who betray them.
better for a cat or dog to remain on the streets rather than being brought to a shelter. Because they are so at risk in this concrete society. It's very, very frightening. I couldn't sleep at night knowing they were still out there if I had had a chance to take them out of this world, if that was the only option left for them. If you can harm them, great. But if you can't, I do think that it would be better not to put them back in the alley and leave them to the mercy of juveniles, the weather, starvation, disease, and all the things that befall them, because those things do happen. Some people would make some commitment to the animals. They will put out food for these stray cats or stray dogs. Uh, so they'll keep them on the borderline of health. They'll mm -hmm. keep them alive. It kind of prolongs the suffering a little longer. And in fact, these animals become so debilitated that the kindest thing we can do for them is to pick them up and give them a humane death. I think the humane community in general has the position that there are worse things than death. People often ask why unwanted animals are euthanized. Isn't there some place we can put them? People have to realize the incredible volume of this problem. You could build cages to the moon. You could build hutches from here to the ends of the earth. You could not home all the homeless animals there are. A common letter I get from eight and nine-year-olds is, when I grow up and have some money, I want to build a farm where I can bring in yeah. all these homeless animals. That, that's a, a great fantasy when you're eight or nine years old, but grow up. It is impossible. It cannot be done. There are too many animals out there. And anybody who claims to be rescuing all these animals uh, you know, is living in a fantasy world, too. There are animal shelters called no-kills that feed upon these fantasies. No-kills are basically animal warehouses where a limited number of cats and dogs are confined until adopted. If not adopted, they live in cages for the rest of their lives. Many of these no-kills accept only those animals that are adoptable, healthy puppies and kittens. All others are turned away. In their fundraising, no-kills condemn full-service shelters which accept all animals and have to euthanize those not adopted. No-kills don't tell the public that the unaltered animals they refuse or adopt out will later add to the problem. They use provocative language which preys upon the emotions of people seeking simple solutions. never destroy. We find loving homes for our little orphans. We won't kill them. Only your dollars can help us save them. They boast that they never kill, yet they ignore the miserable quality of life of an animal imprisoned in a cage year after year or enduring conditions like these. So-called no-kills betray unwanted animals and mislead the public by claiming that they are morally superior to those shelters which euthanize. Their solution is to build more cages. Frequently, this no-kill philosophy leads people to becoming animal collectors. An animal collector has a pathological addiction to accumulating animals, usually cats and dogs. These collectors sometimes operate small no-kill shelters, where they take in large numbers of unwanted animals into their homes. Collectors all share some common traits. They have a hero-martyr complex. They attract public sympathy. And they never euthanize, even the sick and the dying. They abuse animals through neglect by overcrowding, unsanitary conditions, inadequate food and water, and no veterinary care. 
collectors never spay or neuter their victims, and they seldom offer animals for adoption. Sometimes they take animals out of full-service shelters and tell the public that they, quote, rescued them from euthanasia. They often solicit funds from the public by portraying themselves as saintly animal lovers. Their addiction is reinforced by people who give them unwanted animals. Collectors live a life of dark secrets. The public seldom sees behind the facade. Recent law enforcement raids of various collectors' premises have given us a look at these appalling prisons for animals. Collectors are primarily motivated by a pathological need for power and control. So they imprison animals for the rest of their lives. They deny them needed veterinary care. Sick and healthy animals are thrown together to await their demise. In their quest for power, the collector decides who lives and who dies. There's two bodies in this kennel. These dogs suffered a horrible death from thirst and starvation. Are they dead? Yeah. This dog died of thirst on a pile of excrement left by previous victims. While near by, another awaited a similar fate. Get a left hand on the fast enough. Mm -hmm. You know if I'm holding on the road. This cat shares a filthy cell with the body of another victim. While this cat died in the carrier, someone used to abandon him at the collectors. He was denied a painless death. Imagine the suffering this Afghan endured. That's her paws. Collectors and their supporters believe that the quality of life of an animal is not important. All that matters is that the animal is not euthanized. kill warehouses, collectors, and people who cast off responsibility onto others comes from the widespread mentality that cats and dogs are possessions no one should be without. For example, the pet food industry often uses advertising that features kittens and puppies, which encourages the mania for more and more litters. Many shelters push animals to the public, making it easy for people to adopt without carefully considering the responsibilities involved. While this might raise the adoption rate of a shelter, these impulse adoptions also increase the numbers of unwanted animals, 
especially if the animals adopted are not spayed or neutered. Some shelters even offer gifts to the public to tempt them to adopt, a free watch, radio, or some other enticement. The only solution to cat and dog overpopulation is decreasing the birth rate. Ideally, every cat and dog should be spayed or neutered. Shelters could set the standard by only adopting out those animals which have been spayed or neutered. This could be financed by imposing a state tax on the sale of pet food. The monies collected would go directly to programs which spay and neuter all animals before they are adopted from shelters. In addition, this would finance low-cost spay-neuter programs for those animals which were obtained elsewhere. Shelters, humane organizations, and veterinarians must aggressively educate the public that adopting an animal is a privilege and responsibility, not a right. No one should get a companion animal unless they are reasonably certain that they will take full responsibility for the care and expense of that animal during the entire life of the animal. The truth is, people who don't have cats and dogs aren't to blame for the overpopulation crisis. The blame lies with those people who call themselves animal lovers. They are the people who refuse to spay or neuter cats and dogs. They are the people who gush over cute kittens and puppies and the latest breeding fad. They are the humane organizations, shelters, and activists who push the idea that everyone should have a cat or dog and make it easy for people to adopt them. They are the wealthy shelters and humane organizations which spend millions of dollars on fundraising and self-promotion and very little on education campaigns. They are the people who deny a suffering animal a painless death. They are the self-righteous who hide behind lofty rhetoric while others have to deal with the day-to-day -day suffering. The overpopulation crisis and the agony it causes will end only when everyone changes their attitude about cats and dogs. Only then will their suffering stop. Until then, their continued betrayal is our continuing shame. You can help end the cat and dog overpopulation crisis. Spay or neuter your companion animals and urge others to do the same. Speak out and educate others about the overpopulation crisis. Don't buy animal care products from shops that sell live animals. And contact your state legislators and ask them to sponsor a sales tax on pet foods to provide funds for mandatory spay-neuter programs.